the Purpose Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. We're all about delivering great content, thoughtful discussions, and tips and tricks to help you truly get the most out of your life and business. And here's your charismatic host, me, Matt Brown. Hello, how are you? Welcome back. It's an episode of the podcast, and it's also live on Facebook. If you're on my profile, welcome. If you are listening on the podcast stream, congratulations. It is a big deal, and you get all the episodes, as you well know. And if you don't have those, all you got to do is head over to mattbrawningpodcast.com. You can subscribe on the platform you're choosing, and it's totally free. Free, free, free for everyone. So today, tonight, it's Monday, uh, later night, it's about 9.30 as I record this. Uh, so again, welcome if you're on Facebook right now. I decided I want to do something quick. Uh, last week, uh, on Monday, I or Tuesday morning, I suppose I got, I brought you the big overview and the book reveal. I told you all about the new book, The Firebox Principle, what it is, what it's about. I even, I even went through all the seven drives, because it's called The Firebox Principle, The Seven Drives That Fuel Every Entrepreneur. I shared a little bit of some why, some, some motivation about it. Um, I, I guess... For lack of a better term, I, I tried to sell it to you, right? Like, you know, hey, here's the idea. This is what it's about. This is why it's important. What's funny, though, and this is what I want to talk about this week. Um, I didn't write the book thinking, I got to figure out how to sell this book. The book idea came around just because I thought it was such a cool thing I observed. So neat just to watch what was happening. And as I got into it, and it's been really the better part of a year at this point, Um, I sat down with a a publisher, uh, Josh Best. So Josh, shout out to you. Um, Josh is also a huge, huge help in writing the book. And we sat down with Josh almost about a year ago, last August 2017, and started talking about the idea, fleshing it out, researching it, uh, really getting into this. And now it's been almost a year and it's coming to fruition. Here's what I realized. I just this weekend, just this weekend, I got... The whole reason why I wrote the book and I got what it is all about. Would you like to know? Why don't I just jump right into it and tell you? It's really quite simple. It goes a little something like this. It was a story. So let me tell you the story about the story. So I was uh, recording a podcast in the iHeart Media Studios up in Burbank with Maggie Mayfield. Um, so, so cool. So Maggie is uh, helps to produce the afternoon show on Coast 103.5 FM in the iHeart Media Studios. They own um, Alt 98.7 and Coast and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Kiss FM, right? Where Ryan Seacrest was there and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we were up in, in the studio. She let me hit a button, which was really cool. So if you heard a delay, I don't know if I can say this out loud, but if you heard a delay on, uh, on going from traffic back to like the buffer going back into the music and it was like a half a second delay and it was kind of a weird crossfade that was my fault that was maggie saying go ahead and hit the button so hopefully i don't get you in trouble it was awesome anyway it was so much fun and we recorded um a couple i wouldn't call it a mock interview but we recorded a few different interviews um maggie interviewing me she's a great interviewer she's been hosting her own podcast why tune shuffle for a while um, phenomenal podcast. I also got to be on that, which is so neat. I can't wait for that episode to drop. We had a lot of fun. And um, what I learned, though, is I am so used to, and may I even say so good, at long-form you know, interview and teaching and speaking. So you know, put me on stage for three days, I'll fill up the time. Give me 15 minutes, I struggle. Give me five minutes, I panic. Give me 60 seconds, 30 seconds, I freak out. I don't know what to say. I'm going to stumble over my words. So a a lot of what I've been focusing on personally on training as of lately is to get the really condensed, concise uh, communication down. And I'm working on that more and more. So what we did is she interviewed me about the book. And she she, she asked questions like, why you? And and why is this subject so important to you? And here's the truth. I I sat back and I thought, honest truth? Here's the honest truth. I thought, I don't know if it's important to me or not. I just figured I should change my demographic. I want to start speaking more to entrepreneurs because I like like building business. I think it's fun. 
and I didn't think there was a lot of story to it. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, 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 I personally just didn't really think it was. But then we started talking more, and the story came out, and I just, it was weird. I could see it come right out of my mouth. I had no idea it was that impactful, but it hit me, and I've been sitting with it over the entire weekend. That was on Thursday. It's Monday night now, and I just, huh, just been thinking about it. I'm up at a conference right now for my friend Michael Neely. He was on the pod a little while back, a couple months ago. And he's running a huge event called Your Authority Blueprint event that he talked about in the podcast. And uh, and he also, it's pretty cool, he has these podcast, uh, he has a lot of podcasters, me and a bunch of other people are up here. And he has these like drum sound kit booths and people are in there. And the whole thing's really neat. Um, But as I was sitting in there, one of the, there there was a, a speaker uh, talking at lunch today and she was talking all about story I'll probably have her on soon so I'll tell you when, when, when it's her time uh, but she was talking about story and then she said something interesting she said if your story really is powerful you should be able to tell your story in like 60 seconds and I thought man usually my story it, you know, takes a long time and then she said you should tell your story in three sentences be able to tell your story, not every time, but be able to tell your story in three sentences. And I thought, three sentences? Okay, here we go. But as we broke it down, I looked at my new story and I started asking the question about what's my story in regards to this book? You know, um, I'm getting ready to, I've been doing a lot of media training. Um, there, you know, I'll, I'll let you know as soon as, as soon as some, some things start popping, but I'm going from this conference up here. I'm in Monterey in um, central Northern California, probably Northern California, just south of San Jose uh, on, the, on the beach. I'm going to fly from here to Vegas to do a media uh, training and um, TV segment booking event. And the main piece is I want to be able to get you know, off on, on into TV and into radio to promote the book. But I kept asking myself, what's the story? I'm getting to the point, trust me. So I said, what's the story around this book? What's the whole point of it, right? And I realized the story that many of you have probably heard, if you've known me for any length of time, is you know going to Australia, um, not having a lot of money, but getting it figured out. You've heard that story maybe putting on my first seminar. Um, I've shared the story about my friend Kay and how she said it impacted her life. And I've shared all these different pieces of my story. Um, well, no, I, I guess I've shared the whole thing, but the problem is it's always been like, excuse me, uh, it's always been for the seminar world. Uh, the story of why I wanted to get into life coaching, why I wanted to do NLP, why I wanted to speak. But the question of what's the story behind the book, the bigger question was what's the story behind why I even wanted to get into business in the first place. And as I've been talking about the book and all the different drives that entrepreneurs have, I've been relating the drives to different areas of my life, different times in my life. And I realized, you know, one business I started when I was young for the Thrive Drive, another business I started for contribution, um, for world impact. There's different different parts of my life that called for different things that, that I, I was motivated for different reasons. And I had to think back, you know, what's the ultimate goal for this firebox principle, the seven drives of fuel of your entrepreneur? Why does a business need to know this? Why does a CEO need to know this? Why does a startup need to know this? And I think the answer is real simple. It comes down to one thing, culture. It's about not just corporate culture, but like what's the, the if you look at, at a company, a church, a nonprofit, your family, uh, whatever you know, organization of people, whatever enterprise, I talked about enterprises. If you look at it less like an organization and more like an organism, See, as an organism, it's, it's living, it's breathing. There, there's a culture in there. There's an undercurrent of who we are and what we're about and why we do what we do. So to me, culture is everything. So here's the backstory. Ready, ready, ready? Let's go. The backstory. I'm five years old. I'm in my first few days of kindergarten. And I can vividly recall standing behind like a, what I thought was probably a tall oak tree. And I was kind of standing beside and behind this tree after my mom left. And I'm looking around on the playground at all these kids. And I remember thinking, oh, I could never talk to those kids. 
Like who, you know, I don't know. Like I'm not friends with them. I don't know them. And it seemed like they all could play together and have fun and they were all together and, and life was grand. But for me, I, I couldn't do it. I had no ability to go up. So I was, I was scared. Um, I felt left out. Now, again, no one left me out, but I always just felt left out from there. I felt like other people had things to do. Other kids were already friends with each other. You know, they didn't know me, but they were already friends with each other. And, you know, maybe it was just two kids playing or five kids playing or whatever. But I always felt like I was outside looking in. I don't, I don't know if you ever felt like that before. But I felt like I was outside looking in. And I felt like I didn't fit in. And I remember feeling lonely. And I'm in kindergarten, right? And I know there were other days. I, I have other memories in kindergarten where I was playing with kids and you know, being chased around or whatever. And, but the one that stuck out with me most when, when Maggie asked me in, in the iHeart Media studio, she said, why you? Like, why is business important to you? And it, it hit me and I went right back to uh, my subconscious mind, took me back to five years old in kindergarten. And then I flashed forward and realized that all through school, that feeling never left me. I always felt like I was in the outside looking in. I felt like I didn't quite fit in no one came around me, right? And again, that was my feeling. That was my perception. Maybe, you know, hey, if you're, maybe you're listening to this going, Matt, I was your friend in fifth grade. Come on, don't forget. Like, I, I know I had friends and it came and went, but, you know, got, going to junior high, I remember I had a couple of friends from my elementary and then there were these other groups of friends that seemed to all know each other and be best friends and they were all in. It was like this, it was like being the seventh person on the cast of Friends, do you know what I mean? Like it was everyone was there and then there was me kind of hanging out too. And it always felt like that. So go all through high school and again that feeling never left. The feeling was kind of lonely and it was like I'm going at it alone. And if I ever was in a big group of friends and hanging out and you know having fun, I always felt internally like I snuck in. You know, it was just <laughs> Like I snuck in, like like I wasn't supposed to be there, and hopefully no one's gonna be like, "Hey, wait a minute, who led Matt in? He he doesn't belong here." So I always felt like that, and I didn't know what to do about it. I mean, I was twenty one, nearly or no, sorry, it was five days after I turned twenty two. When I was twenty two, I started my first business, and I remember getting a really really clear and big vision around what I wanted to do, and what I wanted to create. And when I got clear on that vision for that mortgage company. I was able to start rallying people. Like I remember um, my friend and my neighbor, Nikki, introduced me to, uh, to a guy she was dating at the time. And, and he came and worked for me. He was like my first uh, employee, I suppose. And, and then his friend came and started doing sales too. And then my friend Anthony, shout out to you, Anthony, he came over and started processing and working. And all of a sudden, we had this little office going. But if I'm really honest, when I look back, what I loved about that the most, in the early days especially, is that there was this vision, there was this team. The team was starting to come around. So what I started learning, and I've done this with every business ever since, when we opened up the, the real estate company right the next year and a half after that, when we got into financial coaching after that, when I started the IPCA for the certification board, when I started Real, edu real Education for Life, that eventually became you know Evolution Seminars, as you, most of you know it now. Um, every business I started, it was always about what was the vision of why we're doing this. And there was um, uh, almost viral, like a, a contagious, I was looking for it, like a contagious feeling of I want to be a part of this, right? There was something to be a part of. So I shared vision and then people began to rally around it, right? It was like, and for the first time in my life as an entrepreneur, I felt magnetic, you know, um, a lot of people nowadays, you know, you see me on stage with hundreds of people or, or speaking or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you see me usually around people and it's hard to imagine sometimes. Again, I hear this, right? For me, it's even hard to imagine myself and remember not wanting to be around people. But for the longest time, I never felt comfortable in my own skin and I never felt authentically part of something, part of the culture. But entrepreneurship is the thing that allowed me to create my own culture. Entrepreneurship allowed me to create a vision that people could then share with me. And when they got my vision, 
when people understood my vision, they came around and they're like, all right, I want to do this. And it wasn't just like for, it wasn't for the paycheck. Like certainly something, you know, paychecks help. But, you know, as I went on in business, it, it was the same, same thing. I'd get people that want to volunteer. I'd get people that would want to intern. I'd get people that would be commissioned. I'd get people that were contractors. Even the contractors who were like vendor almost, right? They'd do some things. They wanted to be around the vision. It was like, hey, you're doing something here. And, and, and there was a community that people got to access. Um, and then obviously employees or you know team members and everything. So regardless of the position, there was always just people being magnetically connected to whatever the vision is I was doing. So I learned there's three simple principles, and I'll share them right now. And this is really what the application for the book is all about. The first principle um, of why it's so important is creating vision. If you can create vision, you can rally people and you can change a community. You can transform a culture. So if you want to take control of your organism or your company's culture, the first thing to do is ask yourself, have you cast a large enough, vivid enough, and clear enough vision? Do they know what you're about? Do they know why you're doing it? What's driving you? That's what the whole point of the firebox is, is the seven drives. Get a hold of what drive is driving you the most, a big one, and wave that flag with pride and show people and tell people and, and, and get behind it. Key number two is care. People must feel and know that you care about them. You can't fake care, right? You can't just pay them extra. You can pay, in fact, you can pay people extra and it'll actually demotivate them because they'll feel like, man, you don't even care enough about me to talk to me. You're just throwing money at me, right? Imagine doing that. Oh, this sounds terrible, but imagine doing that in a relationship. You go, hey, look, it was great hanging out with you tonight. I don't really have time to talk to you right now for the rest of the night. So here's a hundred bucks. Thanks for, you know, hanging out. Like how well is that going to go over with your significant other? Right, probably not that well. They're gonna say, excuse me, you're throwing money at me? Like, you think you can buy me? Right, there's no substitute in real relationship for quality time and for care and concern and money doesn't fix that. Now, in, in, in a career relationship, there probably is usually money involved, but don't mistake paying people or paying more for quality time or care. So number two key is you have to care. And like I said, you can't fake it. Let them know you care. Uh, we could get do a whole episode and a whole seminar, really, for that matter, just about what care looks like. And the third key, um, I just wrote this down today, and it was so, so cool. So the first one is big enough vision. The second one is care. And the third one is puzzle piece. So what I mean by puzzle piece is you need to let people know individually what's their puzzle piece. Where do they fit into the larger puzzle? Um, a long time ago, motivation looked like tell people the one thing they have to do and make sure they can do it and they don't need to know what the big picture is and sometimes in culture we get really big picture focused and we bring everyone into the vision you bring people to the vision let them know you care but the third piece is you have to let them know where they fit in you say listen this is what we're about this is what we're doing and this is your job and this is why you're important this is where you fit and this is why you matter and this is what we expect of you and if you want to be part of this team, you got to do your job. I just finally watched the movie Baywatch, the new one with, with The Rock. Baywatch, right? That came out a little while ago. It's on Amazon Prime now, so I finally watched it. Oh, man, I should have been to the movie theater before. I apologize, The Rock. I didn't. Uh, but I did watch it on Prime. So hopefully you get, you know, 10 cents for that or something. And when I watched that, what I loved about Baywatch is he was talking to, The Rock was talking to Zac Efron's character, and he was a really selfish person. And what really finally got him around was the idea of team and culture. And the culture of Baywatch is we protect the bay. We are Baywatch, right? And everyone understood where they fit in, right? What their purpose was. And the character, the selfish character, finally saw where he fits in. He was a cog in the wheel and he got to do his part. And he got to save the day like everybody else. And it wasn't about him, it was about the team. So... If you can show people where they fit in, but that they, that they are part of a team, now you have community. So I didn't realize I'd been doing this, but for years, for almost, I'm going on my 17th year um, in, in entrepreneurship, ever since the beginning, I've, I've had this weird innate ability, whether it's small or large scale, I've always been able to get people 
kind of uh, gravitating towards a vision and rallying around what I'm doing. And whether it was starting off and having some volunteers or it's, you know, building a, a team of, of W-2 and contractor uh, team members or whether it was my parents volunteering at my at my events or my girlfriend, now wife, right? Lola was one of my first crew at, at every event. Um, whoever it was, whatever it was, I always... I finally found, here's my whole point. I finally found where I fit. And where I fit, the reason I felt so so off was because I, I identified as a visionary. I identified as someone who, it was always hard for me, and I've been learning, but it's, it's always been hard for me to, to wrap myself around someone else's vision. Now, I have learned how to do that in a lot of areas in life, and, but, and I work on it, and, and it's something to pay attention to. I think all of us have to have that visionary piece somewhere in there. But for me, I never, I never truly felt a part of until, until I was 22 and I created my first vision and I watched people gather around and all of a sudden, Hey, it felt like your family, you're supposed to be here, right? You, I belong here. I belong in the center because you're my people. And in entrepreneurship, I finally have my people. So my mission in this next year, the reason I'm pushing this book so much, the reason I'm on the road, the reason I'm going to go do book signings, go book TV, I'm going to go do everything I can possibly do. I'm going to work myself hard to get this accomplished because I believe that the understanding the entrepreneurship culture, if you can get that and you can get that into your business, into your church, into your school, into your family, if you can really get those pieces and sh- and get that drive that drives you inside and motivates you and share that with the people, you will rally people. And what will happen is you'll transform the culture. And if we want to transform the culture of the entire country, if we want to transform the culture of our city, of our county, of our state, if you really want to start transforming culture, do it within that organization. I think especially in America, we are in a free enterprise uh, country. And it's a place where it's not going to be, in my opinion, right? And I just interviewed Larry Broughton last uh, week. The episode dropped on Friday. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch that or listen to it. Watch it. It's on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Matt Browning. You can find it there. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. You get all the podcasts dropped uh, on the YouTube channel, and you'll see the videos of them too, which is great. But when I talk to Larry, he agrees. He says the exact same thing. He says, I don't think that the country is going to change through politics um, it's going to change their entrepreneurship. Um, we have the ability to transform culture. When you get companies like Tom Shoes and Zappos, you know, looking at things differently and Google, we have the chance to really do something cool. And I think it starts with the people. So um, that's my rant for this week. I hope you enjoy. Uh, I hope you enjoy your week. Thanks for hanging out on the podcast. Make sure you like or comment on the video. If you're on Facebook, if you're listening to this on the stream, thank you for the download or the stream, however you're listening to this or consuming it. Um, If you can, if you haven't already, would you swing over on Amazon, or not Amazon, um, iTunes. (laughs) That should be clear about that. Um, Head over to iTunes and give me a rating and review. I would sure appreciate it greatly. Thanks so much, and I will see you next week. (laughs) 